that's a, that's a good tip and trick is just, if you can and have the resources um, to have a back end of the house person as well. It's just a lot to hold um, if you're trying to facilitate or present and do all of the technological stuff. So um, that's our first one. But welcome. Welcome to the third and last workshop of Monday of Shape the Trainer. This is our second annual virtual workshop series. It was in-person workshop series last fall. Um, and now I think that there has been some really accessible parts about um, moving to virtual uh, for a variety of reasons, right? And so we'll talk about some of those and some of the benefits. Um, we talked a lot, I think, at CSU about ensuring that virtual spaces are accessible um, for our different populations. And now we're going to talk about some of the benefits and why I'm starting to prefer uh, virtual spaces, specifically in a training realm. So I want to talk through that. Um, it is great to see folks, uh, Kathy, Joanne, Emerald, Pete's here, Alicia, Sarah, hi. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here. It was intentional also to put in um, a hope or expectation that you have at the workshop, um, and I'll share with you that later on. That's just a little tidbit. Okay, so hopefully you are in the right space, that you came because you were expecting an anatomy of training, the agenda, and the virtual platform. Dun, dun, dun. Right? So I think one of the pieces about Right, it's critiqued a lot in the educational sphere. If you're an expert in something, then obviously you can teach it. No, it's a whole host and slew of skills that require the ability to teach something if you know something. Similarly with training, right? Similarly to supervision. We think that just because we can do positions, that there isn't a whole slew and host of um, skills and abilities to uh, connect to that needs to be fostered. Um, and so thank you for being here um, for this one, because that shows that you recognize that there is a little mysticism and magic to training, that there is a, a recipe um, to uh, effective training, um, and we'll go into that. For folks of you who don't know me, my name is Emily. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I serve as the Assistant Director for Training and Development in the Lori Student Center. I have the opportunity to work with some of these fantastic folks here in this workshop, as well as work with SLICE and co-curricular leadership. Um, so Rachel and Michael, I get to work really closely with and a variety and number of folks on this call too. For those of you I haven't met, I hope to meet soon, um, even in the bizarreness of the world um, and the challenging uh, Space that we're in socio-politically and in a very historical racial justice movement. I think all of that um, contextualizes uh, where we are and find ourselves moving into the fall semester um, and some of the unrest and um, apprehension. And so where can we find our ground in um, possibility and connection? And so I hope that that's some of what brings you here today as well. It's really great to see so many of you here. So um, we're going to talk more about your platform uh, in the second half of this, actually the last third of what I have for us today. Um, but know your platform. Hopefully you um, are a little bit familiar with Zoom. It's kind of been everywhere. If you are not, welcome to the first one. Uh, you will see a screen either um, on your tablet, on your phone, on your uh, computer screen, or if you're calling in, that has a good call in option also. Um, we'll talk about that when we talk about the different platforms. But if you are in something that you can see, I'm sharing my screen um, and I have a PowerPoint going with captions. Um, I'm utilizing the PowerPoint function in Microsoft Office 365, which is the web based, and that allows for real time subtitles and captioning while you are presenting and that if you are able to see you are seeing um, on the screen it is imperfect and better than has been before um, there's still some tweaks that we're working out with it but just really want to take this training to make a lot of the implicit explicit so when we're talking about accessibility we're talking about training kind of how to do and then we'll end up this session with a q a space where hopefully you can ask whatever um, you want to and i don't promise to have all the answers but hopefully some of them so, uh, we ground in the principles of community. They are imperfect as well. We are not there yet, and we very much hope um, to be working towards inclusion, integrity, respect, service, and social justice as 
um, grounding principles to recognize that we are part of a community that is bigger than ourselves and to move towards more collectivism um, and push against individualism, especially amidst the pandemic, um, will benefit uh, so much of the community. So we hope to uh, ground in that in our trainings as well. So what this is <laughs> and what this isn't. What this is um, align with the training outcomes or objectives and takeaways that I hope you will um, have when you leave this space. Being that you'll have an understanding of different components of effective training. You will receive resources on how to format effective training and become familiar with different virtual platforms. Specifically for this one, because it's an hour and 20 minutes, we'll do an overview of Zoom and Teams specifically. What this is not, it is not a deep dive and expert course on virtual engagement techniques. Um, if you have been in Zoom or Teams spaces, uh, you may be very familiar with what we're going to cover in the last third of the training. And I would invite you to leave at that point if you feel proficient in that, right? Um, if you are interested in uh, more virtual engagement techniques, I encourage you to come back on Thursday where Sarah Stevens will do a deep dive in some virtual engagement. So that's my disclaimer, <clears throat> curbing expectations. <laughs> so what we'll cover in the flow, this is a little bit of our roadmap of um, our time together. An overview of what is this concept of effective training, I keep saying that, what does that mean? Uh, touch on a theory of experiential learning. We're gonna talk about engagement and how important that is um, and go over some course concepts. We'll go into a little mini break and that will be an invitation to depart for folks who feel like they've gotten enough out of it. We'll do an attendance link before that mini break um, so that folks can um, take their leave if you like. This is all about agency and your choice to engage how you want. After the mini break, we'll go over Zoom, um, we'll go over Teams and then do a question and answer. One of the biggest things is that I want you to realize that the resources extend beyond just these Shape the Trainer workshop series um, or these connections that uh, we can be connecting and answering questions all along, right? The folks who are here are also interested in training. And so who's on this call? Who's making the time and space um, or has the ability to make that time and space to come to some of these trainings? Utilizing um, our folks and community around us is really powerful. So, here are my hopes and commitment for our time. I would ask that you be as present as possible. As present as possible means a lot of different things. I am currently looking, I have the advantage and benefit to be looking at two screens. I took that second screen from my office because I figured we were hunkering down for a while. Um, but sometimes when I'm in virtual spaces, that means that I'm texting on the side or that I'm doing approving timesheets or I'm doing something else. I would love, I'm going to build in breaks for you if you can be as present as possible with me. I'll try to fluctuate my voice and make it as inclusive and entertaining as possible with engagement. And it's just really helpful for you all to be as engaged as you possibly can be. And for a variety of reasons, you may be able to have your camera on or off, um, but dang, sure on those virtual faces, especially where some trust has been built, um, it is nice for those cameras on um, for the presenters who are doing feedback. Um, I commit to having a couple breaks for you. As I mentioned, I better stop talking so much so we can get to them. <laughs> um, I want you to get comfortable asking questions. I want to see that chat bar um, light up. I want to see things. Rachel is going to help um, moderate some of that. Um, I will look to it also. And so if there are questions that come up, utilize it um, and I'll be utilizing it as an engagement tool uh, throughout. I want you to leave with more questions than you came with. I want this to start um, or continue to be an opportunity to say what don't I know and then work to keep finding the answers. Um, the summer I will share transparently it's been a hard summer because um, it feels like the work hasn't stopped and there isn't necessarily the, the same play um, that sometimes I'm used to, as well as being in a historical time that we're in, right? And so I know that it's asking a lot to come to these workshops and keep professionally developing, um, and I commend you already for being here, so thank you. 
you get out of it what you put in, and that goes for me as well as you. Uh, I see very much as this being a 50-50 relationship, um, but hopefully I've prepared some things. Um, and these things you can also be doing and ha having hopes for the folks that you'll be with either in a virtual or in-person capacity also, um, that it can be a give and take, um, a reciprocal engagement um, that I will commit to uh, giving to you, and I hope that you will be as present as possible with me. So here's our first engagement. Lifting the curtain. I want you to use the chat and answer what did I just do? I want you to look at the past 13 minutes and assess me. What did I just do? Whether it be on the PowerPoint that you saw, if you're able to see it, whether it be in the beginning, when you came into the waiting room, throughout, what are some of the things that you saw I did? Use that chat. Yep, set, set up expectations for the training. Set expectations, invited us to participate, set the tone, try to make us feel comfortable. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Outline, gave guidelines for the flow of the training, invited folks to engage in whatever way possible, welcomed participants, set expectations, opened up to questions, clearly communicated your role and presentation, laid the groundwork, gave the forecast, data organized, asked your needs. Uh, was thoughtful and accommodating to us participants introduction and invited us to do the same. Create a container for the space, clarified content, set expectations and engagement, encourage participation, welcome to each individual, acknowledged presence, set expectation, invited us into the space and to participate and provided the agenda and presentation. What's great about this, and I hope that they keep on coming, is that when I was planning this, I had intentions and you all just demonstrated through real-time feedback that my intentions, some, at least for many of you, aligned, right? So when I talk about lifting the curtain and what to do and making the implicit explicit, that this is, Kyle Oldham talked about it this morning, Dr. Oldham, of like this meta, like a training talking about training is very like, <laughs> and so we'll take these pause moments to say, okay, what just happened there, right? Um, and so we keep you well. Thank you for engaging in the chat. Um, and we welcome the voice also, and I'm gonna curb my expectations because it is close to the end of the day. Uh, and so thanks for engaging how you can. And it is always welcome. You just pop right off of that mute and I will gladly welcome you in, right? Okay. So my hope is that I welcomed and engaged, um, oriented you all to the space and kind of, uh, it looked like there was a word comfort um, that was displayed by some, which is great. Um, curbed your expectations, what it is and what it isn't. Shared my expectations and my hopes um, of what it is and let you know where we were going, right? Um, when you look at things like personality assessments or Myers-Briggs is some um, that some dispute, I still find a lot of value in. Um, many people need to know where we're going before you get into the nitty gritty of it, right? And so um, that's kind of appeasing uh, all sides of the spectrum. I wanted to say it's a binary, but. Okay, so training as it is, it seeks to ask or answer a question. When we think of a training, there was a topic or something that sparked you and your interest in saying, I'm gonna to commit to some period of time to be in this and I don't really know what it'll be. I have a three sentence <laughs> um, description, but I'm gonna come, right? The example is like, what is customer service? That could be the question that it answers or asks, right? This is how you use X equipment. So I want you to go back to the chat now. And I want you to think about a training that you participated in. It could be this one. It could be knowing probably the audience, right? You kind of work to your audience. I'm guessing we've been in some trainings, right? So whether it be training through the Vice President for Diversity, whether it be attending Safe Zone, whether it be onboarding for your job, what is a question that training has asked or answered for you in the past? So think about the PDIs, which are professional development institutes that are run through TILT. Think about everything if you um, are familiar with some of the uh, 
send outs that the provost has been doing around really engaging around virtual classrooms. That's, there's a lot of that coming out, um, specifically for folks who are in teaching roles. So what in your past of training has been a question that's been asked or answered for you in the past? Where are you in your self-growth as a supervisor? Oh, that's a great question, right? How do you provide and receive feedback effectively? Uh, as someone who is constantly evaluating and hopefully reframing my relationship with feedback, that is so necessary in terms of growth. Thanks, Alexis. Thanks, Nancy. Tina says, what are our values as a university? Oh my gosh, absolutely. Michael Marr is gonna do a session for us tomorrow on the mission of the Lori Student Center and how we align it, right? And the question that asks is what is our mission and how do we implement it into daily life? Thanks, Tina. Michael, how to de-escalate conflict. Oh my gosh, so important. Alicia, what is the mission of our department? Sarah, how do you build community informally through an established or formal infrastructure? Building community. Wow, we are in some times where it is so necessary and challenging. Um, so what we see and are experiencing, um, not just see, but kind of ableist language, right? But like what we experience holistically. How can you create a virtual classroom that is engaging, clear, and objective driven? Oh my gosh, right? I think about that a lot when we're thinking about even these trainings about how they can be engaging, how we can keep folks um, participating. How do we navigate moments of crisis while bringing in systems of support? Jasmine, <laughs> such necessary, right? And I would even say like in these times of crisis, um, on a variety of different levels, right? Either interpersonal, within groups, in systems. Um, what does that support look like and what does sustainability in this look like? Um, I think a lot about the critiques of white folks who are trying to engage um, sometimes problematically, sometimes effectively in the racial justice movement and the critique around burnout and what does um, support of the movement so we can keep going. Thank you so much for folks who have um, thought about that. So when you leave this, I want you to think about training in terms of asking or answering a question. And that leads me to purpose, right? What is our purpose around training? Oh, Rachel and I looked through this and I was like, I'm going to fix that graphic. And I did not. So for those of you who are able to see the PowerPoint, it is blurry a little bit. Um, that is not you staring at a screen from the end of the day. That is, in fact, a blurry, <laughs> blurry thing. Um, one of the things, you know, when we seek to ask the question, like, what are we asking and answering? What is the intention around why we're having a training? That is part of this active experimentation, the planning, trying out what you have learned. My hope <laughs> is that part of these workshops prepare you and position you well for what comes in the fall. While there are some ways that we don't know what's coming in the fall, um, we know that we're gonna be asked to engage. And my, my hope is that you'll be more comfortable to engage virtually through trainings like this and other ones. So what have you learned and how do you try it out and how do you plan around that? So that active experimentation. Concrete experience is the doing or the having of the experience. Like what are you doing? So if I were thinking about, um, like Nancy and I talk a lot about equipment um, in environmental services, right? How do you use the vacuum, right? I would love a vacuum that's on my back in, in my, my house, right? And so, but what are the things, and you have to have kind of the experience, you can have the training or planning and then the experience of using it. And then reflecting, right? Maybe it's also talking about um, having a concrete experience of an ethical dilemma in the bookstore or having um, an ethical dilemma around how you're engaging in case management when you're taking a phone call. Um, there's all these different possibilities and ways that we can see this. And so how do we review or reflect on the experience, right? I think about Michael who works with the LSC governing board um, and thinking about how to move or how to train around some things and then being in that reflection. We speed this up in training times, right? You're gonna to get to a point where I'm gonna ask you to reflect. I just asked you to reflect on a time or a training that you had that you could remember of answering or asking a question. That was engaging some different parts of your brain from an experience that you had. 
from the reflection that you have, then you make conclusions or you learn from that experience. You learn what works, you learn what don't. I don't know about you, but I have been in plenty of jobs where I'm like, I learned what I do not want to do in that or where my strengths do not align and how um, that will inform my future jobs or um, how I build teams that are uh, full of um, people with different strengths, right? And then it circles back, right? You apply what you learn, you try out, you plan, and you start all over again. So when we think about how this applies to you all who might be supervisors or asked to do training in your different departments, we see it as this, right? We plan the why, the prep, the practice, around a training, right? There are, there is um, an equation that I think Sarah Stevens taught me, um, which is for every good hour of training, um, it takes four hours, three to four hours of planning and content. Now that might be real for some of you, and then some of you might have the content just flowing, but to be really thoughtful about how we plan out things so that it sticks and that, that learning um, stays with people, it does take answering our why and what are our objectives? How do we start with where we want them to go? That's our why. How do we prep around it and then practice? And then we do the training. We do the dang thing, right? We, we have them gather. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that in, in a bit. Um, but maybe they gather um, in a virtual space and you don't want to just be like, oh, what do you want to talk about, right? If I had just brought you all here and it's like, okay, ask some questions, that would be an approach. Um, and hopefully some of the content that you're experiencing here will drum up some of those questions, right? So um, you do the training, you assess through feedback. As we've seen, it can be real-time feedback. It can be feedback afterwards, where when we send out the assessment afterwards, I hope some of you will take the time uh, to fill it out. Um, Michael's our uh, assessment uh, <laughs> extraordinaire in the Lori Student Center. And so I've learned so much from him. And then we conclude, if it worked, if it didn't, what needs to shift and change, and then we plan and do it again. So thinking about this theory of experiential learning, and not only the people within it who are going to be trained, but you all as the trainers, having experiences around training and then honing or finessing your skills around it too. The stuff isn't magic, but it takes um, time and it takes practice. And I'm still, I'm learning every day. Um, I've been in my position two years and in some of my other positions, I was fortunate enough to do training before. And I'm still gleaning so much from people who are on this call and this work, um, workshop, et cetera. So with that, what parts of this model do you already use? And what I mean by that is <laughs> I could have 10 people say, uh, we train, <laughs> we do the training, right? And that might be where it starts and stops. Um, maybe you incorporate reflection into one-on-one -on -one meetings that you have with students, right? It doesn't have to be, you don't have to think about the whole cycle in it, but where are parts of this model that you already use? And what could you increase, right? Hearing me talk about the different process of it, what could be increased? I want you to use that chat again. Or my nudge is that if anyone wants to come off mute, share a little story, I would. That'd be going above and beyond. Challenge by choice. Okay, oh. Emily, I'll pull the, I'll pull it. <laughs> and you got it. Nancy got it. Michael and I are coming to you after. <laughs> I was going to say, tag, you're it, Michael. Um, as far as training, even when I was teaching, it was tell it, show it, do it, and then have them practice. And just having those different experiences, because not everybody's tactile, not everybody's verbal, not everybody's visual. If you combine all those, you're going to hit... 90% of your people. But as far as what I kind of fall back on is probably that reflection piece because we usually hit the floor running and I forget to go back and reflect. So there's my piece. Michael, you're it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, I, I'm, 
I, um, my, my position, I, I see myself with the planning and ref, um, reflective mode most often. Um, there has been opportunities where I'm able to do the training part of it, but it's mostly those two of those. What I love about what just happened is that Nancy exemplified the, yeah, we plan it, we, we tell them, show them, do them, get them in it, but we don't reflect. And Michael's like, I I'm an assessment. We're looking at stuff. We're reflecting. We're thinking. We're doing it. I want to do the training now. And so I love that acknowledgement of wherever you all are and wherever your position allows you to think about your own professional development and where you can get a little bit more uh, nudge, which is why I'm really excited about Michael presenting tomorrow, right? So like, it's those things about, and then, you know, having future conversations with Nancy and, and hopefully others of you of like, how do we incorporate reflection, not even just at the beginning um, in that training, but throughout, right? Whether that's reflection in the offboarding of, talk to me about what some transferable skills are that you'll take into your next job. Um, that's a powerful question as someone is heading out the door to the next chapter of whatever they're going to do. Awesome. I'm seeing the chat is uh, a little quiet because you were so captivated by uh, our, our folks, our volunteers who came in <laughs> with their voice. Um, so we'll kind of keep going. I'm trying to remember what, okay. Um, I was trying to remember what time this is supposed to end <laughs> and work backwards from there. Okay. So here, if you're familiar with the office, oh good, I'm, I'm seeing some laughter already. Uh, you can't hear it <laughs> in this, but um, so the office is oftentimes a really good place to source bad examples of things. I tried to find the least offensive uh, example um, within it, and sometimes that's hard to do. Uh, so I, I don't vouch for the entire show, um, but this one uh, felt particularly apt to what we talked about. So I am going to... All right, so I'll invite you to watch it. The closed captioning should be on. Uh, <laughs> my hope is that no animals were harmed in the shooting of that, of that scene. Um, Oh my gosh. All right. Uh, let's go to the chat. What, why is, why, why is this a bad example? Why is this a bad example of experiential learning? I mean, he had a good start, right? People learn. They banned it. I know. Great. But he, people learn in different ways. I use PowerPoint. It's boring. I really laughed at that as I was making my PowerPoint for this, right? So why was, why, yes. So Sarah says, perceived risk is good in experiential learning, not real risk. Absolutely. Forced participation. They did not. It was not challenged by choice. They were, they were, they were challenged and they, they had to participate. Oh, dear. Bad training all around. I know. So, so much. Yes. Um, so keep those coming. Um, hopefully uh, provided a bit of levity. And that it grounded in training, you know, I was looking up like YouTube, funny training clips, and then all these Comcasts came up and the comment section were all over the place. So, but this one, I do appreciate it that it focused on experiential learning, not actual risk, right? And so people can learn when their boundaries are pushed a little bit, right? When they're in that growth space, but you go too far, um, and then that's crisis, and then people get hurt and harmed. Um, and while, yes, this is a, a sitcom, a situational comedy, uh, there could have been a lot of harm done to that emotionally, physically, and otherwise, right? Um, <laughs> thank you for participating. I hope you enjoyed it. And it is our next lifting of the curtain. So I want you to go back, think about what I just did. So from the time point of like there was the beginning, we talked about expectations, flow, et cetera. Now, 
since then to now, what did I do? And critique too is welcome. Gave outline of a good training flow and gave an example of how not to do it. I appreciate how thoughtful people are being about these responses that they're typing them out. Showed a video clip to keep audience engaged. Yep, multimedia. Brought some levity to the training and had a chance in presentation, a change in presentation, video from PowerPoint to break up learning style needs. Yep. Continuing to engage the audience, not just uh, you talking for an hour. I know, right? <laughs> Provided multiple platforms to learn. It gives your mind a break from content. Absolutely, right? That applicability of it, right? That experience. So we had content um, where we talked about Kolb's model of experiential learning and then how do we see it kind of in action or in a way that, that might be memorable, right? And then asking to reflect on it now. Uh, use different types of teaching styles, provided content, gave example, and tied it back together. Laughter loosens us up. So our teeth on screen when laughing, yep, or at least my guttural laugh. Um, that is one of the most challenging things in here, right, is that I can see some of you all uh, who have made choices uh, around the video, um, but you all are being so respectful with your mute on because that's what we have come to learn in this recent reality of like Zoom etiquette. Um, it's like, oh, there's feedback and all of that, but that, that feedback is, is hard to not, not hear and laugh together. It feels so good to laugh with others, just seeing it. Um, it seems like it's been so long. Thanks, Tina. Absolutely. So we started off, we had some content, we broke up the different learning modalities of it, and then I asked you to reflect on it, right? So um, that kind of, again, sequential of tell them where they're going to go, take them there, um, and then ask them where we went to be able to apply it. So let's review a little bit. Core components, um, and I will also share, Rachel, maybe now is a good time to put that attendance link um, in for the first time. Um, so if you click the link that Rachel's going to put into the chat um, and give us your email address, um, you'll get a, PF, a, a PFD, a personal flotation device. Whew, uh, you'll get a PDF of this presentation um, so you don't have to wildly take notes um, around some of this. And so we will share these uh, afterwards as well as the presentation will be on uh, the SHAPE YouTube channel. So core components, again, intention. What is your why, right? Um, I feel like it's a little cliche. I don't even know if Simon Sinek was the first person to do it, um, but I do know that there's a TED talk out there that talks about starting with the why is so much more important than the what or the how, right? Um, it's like, oh, we got to do a training. Oh, let's fill up time, do this and this and this. And people can kind of feel it, right? Um, when you see a need, when you know the position needs to be successful if they can run the POS system, <laughs> that's your why, right? Like to give good quality service and customer service so they don't have to be figuring out which buttons they need to um, do to ring people up, right? So you train on something so you can be more present for something else. So what is your intention? What is your why? Tell them where they're going and take them there, right? Hopefully no big surprises. Um, feeling a sense of comfort and security in the space because we do learn best when we're challenged and we can be challenged when there is a feeling of safety also, right? Set expectations and you can return to them, right? So maybe some of this training is at the beginning of your position, but then you reevaluate professional development at uh, staff meetings or um, assess how the expectations have been going throughout your time together as a staff. Sarah, here it is. Engagement every seven minutes. I haven't timed it, but my hope is that I'm asking you to pop into that chat every seven minutes, or I'm asking you to hear from someone that's different than me or I'm asking you to watch or experience a video um, every seven minutes. 
uh, to keep that engagement specifically on virtual. And Sarah's going to talk more about that on, on Thursday. Divide content delivery and other mediums, um, right? So yes, there's PowerPoint. Yes, there is talking and audible. Um, there's typing and reflection. Um, and in different ways, and uh, when we dive into some of those engagement uh, techniques, there's lots of different uh, options out there of different ways to do it. And it's, it's, it's kind of fun to learn about and can be overwhelming. I know I got really overwhelmed when um, we were asked um, to shift and pivot immediately. <laughs> um, divide, con yep, I did that. Um, application of content plus reflection equals learning, right? So that's just that little, you know, I talked about there being a, a bit of a recipe to training uh, and to learning that sticks. Um, that kind of breaking down Kolb's experiential theory. Feedback and revision. Um, I think there are some areas in staff, I think Place does this really well, of taking those assessments from the year prior to in, in training their staff. Uh, and then applying that to the next and following year. Again, um, if I hear that word unprecedented one more time, and it's a, a bit of a unique situation, so all of us are having to shift a little bit differently than we anticipated. And then consider accessibility and familiarity. When I say that, I mean um, accessibility in mediums, in modalities, in um, folks, if they not making assumptions around, right? I did it at the beginning when I was like, Lots of you are probably familiar with Zoom. Well, unknowingly, I might have ostracized someone who's like, this is the first time that I've gotten on. I'm not, I wasn't even sure what to do. I had to log on 20 minutes before, so I just like felt, right? We don't want to necessarily make um, assumptions around what has been accessible or familiar to folks um, and really welcoming in uh, ability to ask questions and to play with some of those, which is why we'll spend the last third um, in those virtual platforms. Accessibility being um, that we're going to lengths to try to have captioning as available as possible in ed as many of the workshops as possible, and we know it won't be for all. Um, so uh, YouTube has functions around um, captions too. Better to go back and edit them afterwards. Um, but everything from um, not only that, but can some of your training be asynchronous? Asynchronous meaning that it doesn't all have to happen at the same time. People don't have to be gathered in this space at the same time, right? Um, asynchronous could be someone watching a training like this um, or watching like small 10 minute clips and then uh, submitting reflections um, based on their learning at different times. So people could learn if they learn better at midnight or 1 a.m., um, they could do it then when someone else is, is a morning person, right? So um, asynchronous and that also um, alleviates the strain on the internet because I might be coming in and out verbally for some of you because there are millions of people literally trying to use the, the internet right now, right? <clears throat> so asynchronous opportunity or um, provides some opportunity around that as well. As far as resources, um, the training agenda template, Rachel is going to pop into the chat. Um, something that I like to use, it might not work for you. It might work just fine for you. You might want to tweak it and make it your own. I highly encourage you to do that, right? Whatever logo you want to pop on or whether you want like it to be a graph. Some people do their training agendas or templates in Excel. There's just a lot of possibility, but it helps you plan that out. It helps you start with those objectives or intentions or outcomes to say, does what we're doing actually align with what we said or what our hopes are that we were going to do? So Rachel popped that into the chat. Hopefully um, folks can see it. Let us know if you're having issues with that. Yeah. Oh my, you can hear all of my sound. Uh, media sources. So we're in this time period of the internet where many people um, have at least a phone or a smartphone that is within their community or accessible to them. Um, libraries are still functioning in different ways. Um, there's lots of media sources. So YouTube is actually a great place to also get lost. <laughs> I spent too much time on this training because I was just enjoying all the clips. And um, there's just so much that you don't have to feel Strung out, strung out on your own, right? You don't have to feel like you're the only person doing this. Um, and along with that, 
there are people around you, right? There are folks who are both on this call um, who would potentially love to engage in a conversation around like, well, what does it look like? And maybe if you help me or out around this, I can help you out around this. So how do you incorporate different modalities um, of case studies? Um, having something where they have to apply something that they've learned in a setting, right, where there is perceived risk, not actual risk, as was evidenced in the chat, right? What are different activities that they can do? Um, and arguably, uh, an hour and 20 minutes is a long time to even ask folks to participate in a virtual training like this. So I could have you, all right, we're going to turn off all of our cameras. Um, we're going to have you go and move around and do a scavenger hunt around your house and then come back, right? What are some activities that could, could happen? Are there panels that could be done so they hear different voices other than yours? Um, and then a shameless plug for the rest of the Shape the Trainer, <laughs> right? Um, so what are different things uh, that you maybe still want to learn about that we can keep learning about even as summer continues? Um, come back on Thursday for that virtual engagement um, and a variety of other things. If you also have other resources that you think are great, we have 31 people in this training session right now. And so pop that into the chat in terms of, I know that I am only one source of my experiences limited and my identities and experiences and stories shape how I interpret what could be good resources. But what are some other really awesome resources I know Nancy put in a great one in a session that we had before um, that I didn't even know existed, right? So what are some ones um, that exist? Pop those in the chat as I keep talking. This is the example of the training agenda that <clears throat> Rachel just downloaded, or Rachel just uh, shared and you can download. So that again, it just gives you kind of that uh, outline of what is this <laughs> and then who is the audience and then the why is this, right? What are some of those outcomes or takeaways? Um, you'll see very familiar language of how I started our training uh, today. What materials do you need? And then what are some of those agenda ideas or flow? And it doesn't have to be that structured, right? I have some of these where it's like, I just like brain dump everything and then go back and make it make sense, right? Um, I just uh, heard an awesome podcast with Celeste Nig, who um, wrote Little Fires Everywhere, um, that she writes these storylines all kind of aligned and then has to flow them out. And so in thinking about how that is for a training, um, how, does that, how does that look and how does that work? Um, how do you put it all together? Okay, here it is. Rachel, I'm going to ask you to put that attendance link one more time because this is your out. This is our two minute break. We have half an hour left. And if you are interested in doing a bit of an exploration around Zoom basics, around Microsoft Teams basics, stick around. I am also not going to be offended at all if 20 of you decide, no, nope, we're good. That was awesome or not. <laughs> and I'm going to leave and start my Tuesday night, right? Um, regardless, it is 419 right now. Uh, you can pop anything into the chat, but I'm going to ask that we can turn off our videos, have a stretch break, do whatever you need to to get up um, and or move your body in some different ways. And then we will come back at 422. I'll give you three minutes. So make your choice. Fill out the attendance if you're departing and saying goodbye. Um, and otherwise, I'll see you at 422.
All right, welcome back. I feel like I'm entering you back in from like a nap, like a two minute nap or something. Um, that obviously my Chihuahua Stella Luna is taking on my, this is my favorite picture and break slide that I keep using. Um, she's just that content and relaxed all the time. Um, I aspire to be Stella Luna. Um, I noticed, right, again, no value placed either way, um, and a couple left, and many are still here. So before we tackle the virtual realm and reality, I want to invite if there's any questions or answers um, about what we've tackled prior, right? So the anatomy of the agenda, the beginning, the content, the end, maybe it's continuing on. Any questions that are out there or anything that's unclear, um, really want, again, to go back to that hope around getting comfortable to ask questions if it's there, specifically in a virtual form. Hi, Emily. This is Cody. And I hey, do Cody. have a question for you. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if you have any strategies in, so if like you have to prepare a training that's an hour, like are you practicing your trainings ahead of time? How do you know it's going to last an hour? Um, I don't know if you had any strategies or resources to help kind of guide us through yeah. how much content. Yeah, thanks, Cody. <clears throat> um, so I have a couple thoughts, and then I'd love to also hear if other trainers on the call have thoughts, too. Um, you can also uh, add thoughts into the chat. Um, so with training, less is more. <laughs> and we oftentimes overestimate um, or underestimate, which should I say? I'm not quite sure. We put too much in it. We think we're going to get through a ton of content, and arguably on the virtual platform, people are more focused on the content in a uh, synchronous format, and then, like, we got to get it in now to keep them engaged, and really, that's not where the learning is, right? And so, I would say for folks who are um, newer to training or to being in front or to really, I think it's a lot about, um, like, I know I'm a talker. Dr. Oldham called me out this morning for being a talker. And so I know that I need my agendas to be a third shorter than what I think they need to be. I also have had enough of the experience in training settings to know where I can cut, I can extend, I can take a little more time to engage people in conversations or cut it a little shorter, right? So I think what you're asking around um, the practice, practice is awesome, right? I remember. Some of us might have been in places where, uh, you know, public speaking 101 was a thing, and they're always like, practice your speeches, and you're like, ah, I'm just going to go wing it. Um, and some people can do that. Most cannot, right? And so especially when it's um, in the newer, I would definitely uh, play it out even in practicing in your head um, and then adding a buffer. My sister likes to say um, that margins are the difference between stress and ease. And I know that I put some of the, in my mind, less necessary content towards the end so that if it, so I can tell you as much or as little about Microsoft Teams as time will allow, but I really wanted to make sure that we had a good amount of time to get through the, the, the like the protein of it. Does that make sense? Any other thoughts from trainers that are out there or tips or tricks that help and work for them? Uh, one I would add that I've been learning a lot more lately and have tried and it's worked pretty well is having an official start and an official end. So you actually show up at your one hour session, 10 minutes early, let folks in, let conversation transpire. So then you don't have to feel like that cuts into your hour time. And then you can make a very clear like official end. And then you can have a tr an extra Q&A for folks who want to dig a little deeper or it didn't get that time, but you have to be willing to have like 15 to 30 minutes before and after your training to be able to do that. But I'm really liking that one. That's awesome, Sarah. That's really good. You know, we're, um, there's a few of us who are going to a virtual conference next week. And I noticed that they said like the session time is going to be two hours and then there'll be a 30 minute optional discussion and Q and A. And I think that that really goes to what you're talking about of like, 
like what is the, the start time and then the actual start time <laughs> and what's the actual end time and then the kind of trickle out and it gives people agency around how they engage. Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> we have a great would be um, a great ad would be keeping meetings on task and yet still recognizing those who need to speak. Yeah, absolutely. So providing in that flexibility and the you know, sometimes people use this uh, format of like the parking lot, like want to explore that. We don't have time right now, but we'll send some resources afterwards. And so we'll keep it, keep it kind of flowing. Thanks, Nancy. Cheryl says, learn to read the audience <clears throat> and be willing to change what you're going to present based on the audience's needs. Oh my gosh, that is so important um, to really, right? I might have an idea, but if someone asks a question, that took us in a different direction and that question was indicative of where the rest of the audience was, that, that reading of the audience and uh, arguably is pretty tough to do in some different virtual spaces um, and, and absolutely is, is so necessary. And especially when you're working with your own uh, staff and maybe in smaller entities, um, having some more norms around, you know, when we're together for these 20 minutes, if we have the ability, our video is on, um, and then knowing that that is stressful and so other places, but that reading the audience is so important. Thanks for those ads. Okay. <clears throat> the realities of next year. I love Dr. Oldham, Kyle said, uh, we're going to be virtual in some capacity for at least six or seven months. I hope I didn't burst anyone's bubble, but I just appreciated that kind of like, there was no humming or hawing, it's like, no, y'all, like, let's just get on board with this and then we can address it, right? So some of the realities around our year is that we have, there are benefits of being virtual. Um, like it or not, we're in the middle of a pandemic and the impact can be minimized mentally with stress. Sometimes home is not always a safe place for people. I want to make that very clear, right? I don't want to, um, put that presumption out there. We know that the um, levels of abuse and domestic violence, home is not always a secure place for people. For some folks who are experiencing impacts of the pandemic, also there are spaces where I don't have to worry about a face covering right now. Uh, I can read the people um, a little bit who have video on and um, we can gather in ways together in breakout rooms in ways that we just would not be able to do uh, with a number of people in a physical setting currently. And so while I will be the first to say that I prefer in-person reading, getting energy from the environment, now is not the time to do that. Now is the time to model what safety looks like um, and what mitigating risk looks like. So face covering, breakout spaces, flexibility, and differently accessible. So we talked a little bit about that, especially when you think about asynchronous versus synchronous. Um, ability for mid-semester onboarding with recordings. So I think this is a really cool reminder is that now that this has happened, as imperfect as it is, and uh, for like in memoriam, <laughs> there's a YouTube channel that has the Shape Virtual Pro Devo sessions from March into April and May. Um, there are these, and so if, if we explore different ways where recordings could be shared, that means that um, if Nancy or Cheryl need to uh, welcome someone on board in the middle of the semester, that they can also have access to maybe some trainings um, that were done at the beginning of the fall semester. So it makes onboarding um, differently accessible. Um, there are times that there will be necessary in-person trainings. Considering what staffing clusters look like to limit exposure. So I'm thinking about um, an example would be like the bookstore in the Lori Student Center or folks with large um, staff, maybe the Ramskeller who has, you know, 20 or 30 people. Where, wherever there are large folks, are there going to be folks who are going to be on similar schedules? And so how do we limit exposures? How do we um, recognize the ways that we can say, all right, we have 50 people that we're going to hire on for Rush in the bookstore, and um, we're going to have 
five different people because we can't be in groups of more than 10 and there's going to be different stations, right? One of those stations is going to be learning the POS system. One of those stations is going to be taking a tour around the bookstore. One of those stations is going to be um, learning cleanliness practices. Um, another is going to be customer service, right? Those in-person necessary trainings, some of those exist. They have to exist, right? We have to learn some of those things hands-on. And then the other ones that are around presentations, um, how can we have half days and um, let them go and do the Lori Student Center orientation online, right? So, so just thinking about differently of what is necessary and what um, could be virtual uh, in terms of, of ways that, that we move forward. So when we look at Zoom um, as a resource to us, there is a free Zoom option that is open and available to everyone. Um, and then there is Zoom Pro, which there are a couple of different things. And if you have specific questions in about it, um, I can get into it. For one Zoom room, it's about $16 a month. Um, and then it goes up from there in terms of like, you could have one administrator who oversees 10 rooms and that's for like a, a lump sum for the year, right? So depending on what your department's availability for that, I know that the that Ramtech has um, plans too, and those might look a little bit different than that. But some of the benefits or some of the characteristics of Zoom is that um, there's a 40 minute meeting time for the free room. What that means is there's a workaround. You can leave the room and come back, and then it starts your 40 minutes all over again. So that's something that speaks to 21 minutes of content, if that's all they can sit for anyway. If you have half an hour, pause, take a 15 minute break, come back in. So what are some of these workarounds that we could do? Um, there's recording options for both the free and pr pro. Um, you can see up to 24 people and um, there is some recognition and familiarity with Zoom, whether it be the Zoom bombers or privacy issues that they've been mitigating. I think they're on like version five plus now that they're um, enabling waiting rooms and enabling um, uh, passwords that are not optional um, and just some things that are, have been workarounds for this. Um, what I really appreciate about Zoom differently than I do about Teams is that there is a call-in or internet call option. So right now, I'm talking to you through my phone, actually, on the little arrow that is next to the mute or unmute button. You can click that, and it says call in or like dial in by phone. And my phone connection is a lot more stable than my internet connection is. And so I'm able to um, have without interruption, and especially when I'm having conversations about inclusion and social justice and equity. I don't want to be like struggling to hear someone's story and being like, oh, I'm getting 30% of that, right? So I really appreciate that there's that option in Zoom. Breakout rooms are only available for the pro um, and closed captioning, I think is my understanding is only available for the pro. You can see how we're mitigating that on PowerPoint. Even if we didn't have a presentation up right now, we could be sharing our screen and you could be seeing captions at the same time if that was a need of your staff. What Zoom does not have that I think is a big uh, challenge for staff who want to keep having reoccurring meetings um, is this idea of file sharing and memory. That is one that teams really support. Um, and has and is a big benefit. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that in a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's my throat being like, yo fool, you've been talking too long and it's the end of the day. <laughs> We're close, 15 minutes, stick with me. Okay, Microsoft Teams. Benefits, characteristics, meeting time unlimited. There is recording options that lives in those files that I'm going to talk about of why there's a benefit around that. You can see, I think it's up to nine people, but they keep making updates, so they keep competitive with Zoom. So it might be more than nine people now. And I do know that currently you'll notice that there aren't breakout rooms abilities in Teams, but I believe the next iteration and update will have breakout room abilities because they've been trying to be responsive to feedback. The benefit is that CSU folks have access um, 
to Office 365, um, to the Teams, there isn't necessarily the notoriety and familiarity with it. So the training for it has to be different, um, such as things like this, right? <clears throat> and we're just going to scratch the surface on this. What isn't helpful is that there's not really a workaround for folks who have reason for um, people to be joining who are outside of CSU. So I think about like, I don't know, like the Interface Council um, in Fort Collins that has both CSU and um, Fort Collins folks in it. Um, teams would not necessarily be a good option because there isn't that access point um, without it, is my understanding. Again, not an expert, just sharing what I've learned or my understanding. So check me if I'm if I'm wrong on any of this information. I'd love that. Um, it does have closed captioning, um, as you are seeing, but I think again both um, it has. Uh, I think it has it in the meeting option too. Possibly. I think that's why there are different and better closed captioning options for Teams than Zoom. Um, is what I have heard and experienced. Um, it also plays well with Outlook. I do love that when I go to schedule a meeting, it's like Teams meeting, yep, click. And then it's like, oh, I don't need a link. I don't need to go in and schedule something different. Like it just plays really well with some of the formats or structures that we already have at our disposal. Okay, so the captions are gonna go away because I'm going to share my screen, um, but those captions will be, um, oh good. Thank you. Audra says, um, you can invite a non-CSU person to a Teams meeting. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, let's see. Alicia says, that's what we've experienced as well. Okay. Thank you. Nancy, the demographics of my team is not um, that all have access to internet, computer, smartphone, et cetera. Some feel sensitive about not having access and at the same time feel unsafe meeting in person. It's very delicate balance. Abs absolutely. Um, that is an option with Teams. Also, Christy does, um, oh, it is an option. Well, does it with every meeting. It's so funny to go back and read. And I was like, oh, that was probably in real time in response to something I said that I don't remember now that I said. Yep. Um, Nancy, that is an, a, a piece about it that while it's not the same experience, if they have an access to phone, I know people who have taken the agency and freedom to drive across country and they're joining all their meetings by phone. And that's fine while they're not maybe seeing the thing, if we're making a concerted effort to describe and discuss what is being seen and shared on the screen, um, and there are ways that we can incorporate, um, like go to the chat now, and if you wanna come off mute, um, that we're hopefully inviting some of that engagement. So, thanks, um, the call the future. Yep, I was agreeing about closed captioning. Great, see, thanks. And that's feedback that you all are not just zoned out somewhere else. So this see, there's like give and take. This is helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I am going to share a new. Let's go Teams first. Okay. I feel like Zoom gets a lot of attention, so I want to go to Teams first. <clears throat> so when I look, I click on Teams. So this is a, a oh, can you see that? Can I get a nod from someone? Okay. Um, so I'm part of a couple teams. <laughs> uh, and one that I will show you is the shape team, um, which is nice because then I can build out a lot of the things that we do and it has that memory. So um, when I go into the shape team, it also connects with my chat. Um, it connects with my Outlook calendar. Um, I can have calls and files that are all right here. Oh, look, Nancy was saying something. Awesome. And Amy was there too, right? So up here, you can have a chat that is consistent um, and keeps that memory. And then files, you come here and you can share a bunch. So if you're thinking about, uh, I want a connection point for my whole staff, this is a good place and way to do it, right? When they get trained up and trained into it, it is a nice holding center that is differently secure than maybe Google Docs, um, differently accessible and has more space than Dropbox. Um, so some of those are really helpful and nice. Um, there are some frustrations about it that we could go into. I think that the um, Word doc app 
is not as helpful as the desktop app and the formatting is funky, um, but there are some workarounds for that. Um, there are and have been ways that you can just start a meeting um, down here, meet now. So you'll see that I could click this and if I did, it would uh, come up on a notification to everyone here um, who's in this team that I want to meet now and whoever can join can join. So that's a nice, helpful thing. It also has connections to a variety of different apps. It even connects to Zoom as an app. So I have scheduled a Zoom meeting in Teams, um, which has been really helpful. I wonder if I could like show you. Oop. So if I click Zoom, I can click start a meeting or schedule a meeting. Um, and then it goes right in and it all exists in this. So I think Teams is really helpful. And again, just scratching the surface, knowing that we're a little shorter on time, that um, some of these things are really helpful around the consistency of creating a community um, and uh, channels and avenues that you can keep accessing around. So there's that. The other thing, any type in questions if you have questions about teams that either I or someone on the call can answer. <laughs> We've got some teams experienced folks in here. All right, the next I'm gonna share is go back to the office, which is not actually the office. I'm gonna exit full screen. And oh, okay, well, I have Hey Emily. Yeah. When you um when you were mentioning um the uh the desktop, I didn't I didn't know if um because you can switch like within Teams you can switch back and forth to the desktop. Okay, yep. I didn't know you had meant. Uh, sorry, I, maybe I heard that wrong. Okay. No, that's fine. Yeah. So you can switch, and that is what's nice. Is so like I was editing this PowerPoint um for yesterday and i was like it's not doing what i want on the on the web app and then i um clicked like open on my desktop and then i was like oh that's the familiarity that i know and then but it still did the auto save is that what you're asking about or are you asking about sharing yep, desktop? I, yep. mm -hmm. the sharing desktop yeah it can share screens yep. um it can not only share applications but full desktops too which is really nice I'm looking for. You can also add it to, oh, yeah. like, you can also save it, like, their documents, like, you can sync it to SharePoint. Oh. Thank you, Latoya. Good mm -hmm. to know. I don't even know much about SharePoint, admittingly. I, I hear it's an awesome resource, but I don't know much about it. Yeah. Can, you, can you tell us what it is? I mean, I, I think it's just, uh, if you didn't want people, if someone was not in Teams and you wanted to give them access to something, um, you could do it through SharePoint instead. And then I think there's e an easier way to like, um, like editing privileges. Like if you didn't want people to mess with certain things, you can give it to them in SharePoint. Awesome. That makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. Um, yeah, because it was funny. I was trying to figure out how to share files from Shape the Trainer with the presenters who weren't in the Shape team. And I was like, how do I do this? And I did it. A poor way and I wish I had known that way see look at all this this is this is helpful Cody I saw you come on to video does that mean you have something that you'd like to add no I was just going well I was just going to add that um, SharePoint is a great resource it's kind of like Google Drive um, so that you okay. can collaborate and you don't have to have a million different versions of the same document so if you save the document and you're sharing it on your website or whatever then if you update that document then that would be updated. Oh, that's so helpful because I feel that like is such a Google's great example. Only, but I think it's a great example. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah, because it keeps updating. It operates as a place where you can change the, the version of it, but the link will still be the same and all that. Awesome. Thanks, you both. Um, so I'm going to share one last thing about Zoom. So now I'm shifting a little bit um, for our last five minutes into Zoom. And I made a an account for shape um, to demonstrate what a free access looked like, right? So I'm in my account uh, for shape. It's shape underscore call of state, whatnot. Um, and so here I am with all the details. This is my personal meeting ID. 
Um, and usually it pops up with like, you'll only have, I wonder if, so if I try to schedule a meeting, it will let me know that my Zoom basic plan has a 40 minute limit and it's not kidding about that. Like it will kick you out <laughs> and then you can go back in, right? Um, but you'll see it has like meeting. And so if you've, if you've gotten like one of those elongated um, invitations of it, uh, that's where you go down and you, uh, when you save the meeting, um, like I'll go into one that I created for this purpose. So like I created the meeting around, oh, this will work virtual workshop. And you'll see that I can edit this meeting, delete, save it, copy the invitation. Um, so just the link and that has the, um, the link if you directly click on it, has the password already in it. You'll start to see in Zoom, you can't make them without passwords in it. Um, so that's why the direct links are helpful sometimes because <clears throat> then I know I'm always looking for like, where's the damn password? I don't know what that means. Um, you also, it's trying to play nicely as we see with um, Outlook and Google. So let's see what happens if I click Outlook because I haven't used Outlook. I come down here, it downloaded and ooh, you can't probably see it. Um, this is what popped up. So when I clicked that, this automatically popped up, which is really nice. It gives me what the password is, what the meeting ID is, that clickable link, and then I can invite attendees right from here. So again, with that accessibility and that familiarity, um, this is a nice option that like I have seen before and maybe some other CSU folks have seen before um, in terms of working with Outlook. So I'll just, I wanted to share a couple of uh, like how to do breakout rooms and um, how to do polls and things like that. I really want to encourage folks to come uh, to the session on Thursday with virtual engagement. Not that she'll be doing exactly those things, um, but that gets to more of it. I just really wanted to give a shell and an invite to keep utilizing me and other people who have some familiarity around it, right? Because this is where we can resource share um, and crowdsource our information. Um, and again, like you saw, I got information here from you all. And so when we build those connections and, and work collectively, uh, we really can um, bolster a lot of our knowledge. So I wanna recognize, I'm gonna ask Rachel to put the attendance link in uh, the chat one more time. And I am going to talk you through what I'm doing. I think at this point, we're just about done, which is helpful because it is 4.50. So Toya, we went through thing. a little bit. Yeah, Toya. So um, another thing, I'm going back to the team, sorry. Um, I'm a big fan of teams. Um, but there's a, like, a, and when I think about like working with students, um, there's an app uh, within teams where it's essentially project management. And so um, I put all, of like my student staff will put um, their task in there and where they are and you can like they can attach what they're working on and you can add comments and you know you can put complete um, so just wanted to highlight that that's awesome do you know what that app is called um, I'm looking at it now I think if you just even like go to the app and search like project management or um, okay. yeah uh, yeah project yeah project management there is a couple different um, options. Because I know, um, like, I think we uh, use Planner, which is Microsoft, is what we have. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Microsoft mm -hmm. Planner. Uh, Stephanie Moreira, who goes by Mo, turned me on to OneNote. And if folks are familiar with OneNote, it's another Microsoft. Um, it's another Microsoft option of like ways to keep and store information similar to like a Google Drive, but kind of acts more like a uh, like a scrapbook a little bit. So I have these different tabs of like my professional development notes, shape summary, summer offerings, different reports that I have to do, my self email, um, and then I have different tabs around um, like. Uh, diversity, equity, inclusion webinars or, or sessions that I've attended, and it's just a place to like keep everything. Um, so that's a little plug for other um, like Microsoft applications too, um, and I think it could be really utilizable. I love knowing about that project management one, uh, Latoya. I'm definitely gonna gonna look that up. 
All right. We are a minute or two over. Thank you uh, for your patience with it. I know it's the last thing. Um, I will stick around for general questions. Um, my idea was to go back to the chat and see if we hit some of those expectations that you all had. Uh, so at the beginning, I asked for you to introduce yourself um, and uh, ask what you all were wanting. Um, so I'm seeing like get ideas. Oh. Yeah, my hope is that uh, some of the expectations that you came in with have been met. Um, you'll have an opportunity. You can share it with me in the chat. You can stick around and talk with me afterwards. And we'll also send out a feedback uh, survey about the sessions that hopefully you were able to go to today and the rest of the week. Um, and I'm just really grateful that you all were here. So please fill out that attendance. Um, maybe leave one thing that you're taking away in the chat as you take off. That would be awesome. Um, thanks so much for being here. I'll stick around. Um, have a great rest of today. And feel free to come off mute and say bye to everyone. Bye. Is that what she is? Is, is this training? Ah, I don't know what. There we go. Yeah, it's just added planner to my team. Now I need to learn how to use it. Yes. Love lifting the curtain among so many tidbits, exploring more in team. Engagement every seven minutes. Great pointer. Yep. Thank you. Oh, good. Expectations met. <laughs> Have a great one. Thanks all. And if you folks um, are still here, want to come either off mute or uh, come on video and we can have a little convo, um, I'm here for it. And we could probably, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>